You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, everybody. Today's guest is none other than John Feldman, guitarist and frontman for Goldfinger, as well as a multi-platinum, world-renowned record producer. Uh, John and I go way back, and it was a real treat for me to hear his in-depth story behind Goldfinger's breakout single, Here in Your Bedroom, uh, where John was the first time he ever heard the song blasting on K-Rock in Los Angeles, uh, Goldfinger's 1996 Guinness World Record for playing the most shows in one year by any band, uh, and the song John's uh, most proud of that he's produced uh, in his career. So stay tuned. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. I have written a song in my life. Yeah, you've written a couple. You've written a couple. So, uh, as my listeners know, uh, I my, my guests, I like to have them pick a song from from their career. And John's a little interesting because, uh, as many of you know, uh, John just doesn't play guitar and sing in Goldfinger. John is a uh, multi platinum, world renowned uh, record producer. Uh, so th- this literally could have been any song from your career. And I'm but I'm really stoked that you picked here in your bedroom, which is, uh, I besides Superman, they, this is like the defining. Uh, you know, the other defining Goldfinger song, in my opinion. And uh, a lot of times people are sick of, of talking about their hits or the, <laughs> the fan favorites. And I'm really glad you picked this one because uh, there's a lot to talk about with this. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, so I went back and found your demo, Richter. And because uh, I wanted to, I knew that the uh, there was a demo with uh, here in your bedroom and I wanted to hear it. Uh, besides the production value, it sounded a little more demo-y, but uh, the arrangement was the same. So take me back to that time period. Do you, do you remember writing the song? Of course, yeah. Um, so I was working on the promenade in Santa Monica at the time. I, was, I, was, I had been in, a, um, in this funk metal band. So I moved to L.A. when I was 18 and I'd played in bands since I was 12. I was in a punk band in high school. And then um, I, I joined this band, the Electric, Electric Love Hogs, when I moved to L.A. And we, you know, we, we got signed. Tommy Lee produced the record. It was just like this amazing experience. And then we got dropped. And it was like I was back to working retail. And I'd, so I'd, I'd see all these, all these characters. Like I remember seeing Ricky Rackman, who had this radio show in, in Los Angeles on, on, on a KNAC. And he was like a friend of mine. He's like, oh, are you, are you shopping for shoes here as well? And I'm like, uh, what size are you? You know, like I, I, had, right. fucking, I had to go from, from like being a dude in a band to like going back to retail. I was like fucking tail between my legs. It felt – it was just awful. And – um and, and because of that job though, like I, I was driven to really kind of get back to my roots, all the music that I, I kind of grew, you know, grew up on. I grew up on like, you know, the dead Kennedys and the buzzcocks and kind of, you know, a, a lot of poppier, melodic, more melodic choruses. And I'm like, you know what? I, I can't just, I can't be Al Bundy for the rest of my life. I can't be selling <laughs> shoes. I've got to do something. I was 25 and, um, and I went back to the drawing board and I started writing music and I wrote. I think I wrote maybe four or five Goldfinger songs and, and, and I was still like holding on to this idea, you know, Rage Against the Machine had opened for my old, for my, for the Electric Love Hogs. And so I was like, and they, and they started blowing up and I'm like, maybe I want to do something aggressive. And so I, I had this demo tape that had half, you know, one half was these Goldfinger songs I had written. And then the other half was um, kind of moving forward in, in that heavier direction. And I sent it to the guy that signed Weezer. Um, and he said, dude, you have to do Goldfinger. This is way more authentic for who you are. You have to pursue this. And so I had like four songs written. And this girl that I'd worked with at Nana, this girl, Marquia, I, 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 I just kind of, I don't even remember her last name, but she, um, you know, I had the biggest crush on this girl. And it was, it was New Year's Eve 
from 1993 going into 1994. And I wrote and, and it finally happened, dude. It was like, you know, I had like the best New Year's Eve of my life up to that point. It was like I, we finally got together. And New Year's Day of 94, I wrote here in your bedroom in 10 minutes. I just wrote oh it about about the experience of like, you know, I had like this nine month crush on this girl and, you know, we finally got together and, um, and this song just came out. It was just like, you know, and, and it definitely came. I mean, the first concert I ever saw when I was a kid was the English beat. So there's that, um, um, well, I think twist and crawl. I kind of took that drum fill from the uh -huh. beginning of twist and crawl. Like it has that English beat, um, you know, kind of beginning. There's, there's definitely like a mirror in the bathroom vibe. And there is like, there's, there are these kind of moments that you connect here in your bedroom and mirror in the bathroom, like these kind of like things where you're isolated, you're alone. And, you know, me being with that, that girl, it was just like, I don't know about you, Chris, but a lot of my best songs kind of just come out. Like they're inspired, they're in the moment, they're from my own real life experience and they just kind of come out. And that, that was my experience with here in your bedroom. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. And you know, some of the best songs just come uh, about like that, like out of nowhere, it's like you pick up the guitar, New Year's day, 94, <laughs> and here's this song. And now from that moment, um, when did you record the Richter demo? So I had, you know, when, when I got signed, I, I, I actually like for a, you know, I think I was 22 when, when my, when, when the love, the love hogs, the best band name of all time, by the way, got signed. Like I, we fucking, I actually did something. I, I did something smart with, I bought this 12 track recorder. It used these beta tapes. So I actually ha have this recording device and, and I've been messing around with um, producing artists, even back then, like there was a band from Venice that was like the Suicidal Tendencies, a protege kind of band called the TSS, Toxic Shock Syndrome. They were like full V13, like gangster stuff. It was, they were gnarly. And I remember recording their, um, I remember recording their demo on my 12 track in my rehearsal space. I, it was, it's, it's classic too, because the, the, the rehearsal space that Goldfinger used to rehearse in back in the day was, um, was downtown LA. And now that rehearsal space is a, is a, is the Soho house downtown, which is like, oh, wow. I mean, it was, it's really come full circle. And I remember, um, like when we were rehearsing, actually rehearsing here in your bedroom that, that day, our, our, um, our old drummer, Darren Pfeiffer actually like took, we were on like the sixth floor and he put his, he like just took his pants off, put his ass out the window and took a <laughs> crap from the sixth floor, took a crap from the sixth floor <laughs> onto the, like, like I remember we were re actually rehearsing here in your bedroom to learn the song. And I'm, and, and now it's a Soho house. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck is happening? You know? <laughs> Well, but, the, uh, the reason I asked about the demo was because, you know, a, a lot of times the, the, the songs will go through, uh, you know, uh, variations and change and, and, and develop. Uh, but the demo is very much the same uh, chord progression, uh, same, you know, arrangement. I've always had a producer engineer brain where like I, I, if I guess there's the perfectionism in me that that like if the hi hat is, you know, it doesn't have if it's too loud or if the kick drum doesn't have like just the right amount of you know, punch or top end to it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just a tweaker. Like I will just tweak and tweak and tweak. And so I had here in your bedroom, in my mind, I had it completely worked out. I had the arrangement, the dynamics. I had every drum fill worked out. I knew everything that I wanted that song to be. So when I taught, when I, when I showed the band, it was the first song because as a band, it's like, I'm sure your band is, is similar. Everyone kind of has their own, that they want to put their own stamp on it. And, and, and up to that point, we had probably written five or six songs together. And for the most part, I had chords worked out for most of the songs and a melody and a, and a lyric. But um, this was the first song that I really just kind of like, I, I was guiding Darren on how to, Darren was in a hardcore band called Zero Tolerance from Buffalo. So he came from like punk rock and hardcore, but he never really, you know, ska wasn't, or Scott Punk wasn't part of his DNA. And so I was kind of guiding him 
on the whole kind of steppers thing and four on yeah. the floor side stick and that whole thing. So way different brings, feel. Yeah. It's a completely different feel. And, and he, and to be honest, I mean, he's a ripping drummer. We had auditioned probably like four or five drummers before Darren came along. I had Simon and Charlie in the band and Darren came sort of last. Uh, and he was, he's such a fucking solid drummer. And, uh, but he really struggled with that first drum fill of here in your bedroom, the da, 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 that little thing. Yeah. He just, I don't know what it is about the straightness of it. Like it's so straight that, um, he really struggled with it because he had this, um, natural kind of like aggression to his, his style. And so when we were learning that song, I mean, that was the stuff that I, I think took the longest was arranging, arranging the drums. And I think when we recorded the demo at, at the rehearsal space on my, on my 12 track, it was like, um, uh, once he learned it and, and we actually recorded it for the album, it was a much different experience. But I remember that song was probably the longest song it took us to learn as a band. Right. So, so now you're, you're going in to do the record and it sounds to me, John, like you were already really, especially with here in your bedroom, you were producing, you weren't just a, the dude in the band playing guitar and singing and writing lyrics. You were producing, at least in your head, you get in to do, do this record. And, uh, where were you in terms of the production chair sharing that with Jay Rifkin, who has his name as producer on the record? You know, Jay's, uh, um, He's an interesting cat. You know, he, he went to college with Hans Zimmer. They were college roommates. And so Hans Zimmer, clearly a talented composer, uh, you know, he, um, he just kind of like was right place, right time to a certain extent. And so he became the producer of the, of the Lion King soundtrack, which Hans composed. And so he kind of got his foot in the door at the studio. So I was still selling shoes and I had, um, so by the time I was like kind of handing out my demo cassettes, uh, I, 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 we had, I, I, this, there's a reggae song on there that never got, I, I forget what it was called, but we, there's like probably six songs on the demo. I think I could be wrong on that Richter demo that we made. Uh -huh. And, um, this guy, Patrick McDowell knew me from the electric love hogs. And he said, Hey, what are you doing now? Like, uh, what's up with your band? I loved your old band. And I just, I gave him this demo cassette. I, I didn't know a ton of people um, on the A&R side back then. Uh, I gave it to Fat Mike, who um, I, don't, I don't think he ever listened to it, but I remember standing outside of uh, Dragonfly when, when NoFX was playing, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, I fucking love NoFX. This is my band. And I gave it to him, and I gave it to Patrick, and Patrick like called me back within an hour at, at the shoe store. He's like, dude, I got to give this to my boss. And he worked for Jay Rifkin. And so Jay, who knew nothing about any of this kind of music, like he had never heard Bad Religion or any any bands of this genre. And he, he was just like, but he saw, he heard the songs. He heard Here in Your Bedroom as being like a really well put together song. And so we had a meeting. They made it, They made an offer. They offered me, I think it was for a, like life of the first three records publishing $10,000. And I'm like, holy shit. Ten thousand dollars. That's more money than I've ever fucking heard of my whole life. And I said, I'm still I mean, Chris, I'm still dealing with like the fallout of signing this deal as like a, you know, a 24 year old, 25 year old kid. Not yeah. like I didn't trust my lawyer. I didn't trust. I just like I, I just don't want to sell shoes anymore. I just don't want to sell shoes. Yeah. And I signed this deal and it's like. He still owns half the publishing for um, for the first three Goldfinger records, which is a challenge because you know Tony Hawk is uh, they're revamp they're revamping the um, pro skater uh, brand and, and they're putting Superman back in it, which Jay fucking still owns. It's crazy, but you know what? I'm grateful. I have to be grateful because there's no other way. I've got to be grateful that I'm not selling shoes anymore. And he was the guy that got me out of that job, and so. When we recorded that song in the studio, it was like everyone, I, I think everyone involved at the time, like my band, Jay, Patrick, all knew that that was going to be the single. And so we were really hyper-focused on making sure that track was right. And I remember being in the studio and, and, and Jay would kind of fall asleep around nine. He'd just pass out on the couch and I just... I would just tweak on the board and just like, what does this knob, knob do? What does this knob do? And I was just so excited to be in the studio, you know? And I remember like this, I don't know if you've, if you've heard the song lately, but the snare, the snare drum on that song is like, so there's so much top end. It barely fits in the, in the, when you listen to it, it's like this, 
ping to it. Yeah, I, like, listened, I, I listened to the track this morning. Yeah, I listened a couple a couple times before we before we did this. So I know what okay. you mean. <laughs> it's like ping. It's like I mean, we tune the snare so high. I just wanted to make sure that the snare drum cut. And to be honest, like it sounded at the time when I heard it on the radio, it sounded different than anything else. And I guess maybe there's something to it, whether I love it or hate it today, where I don't, I don't like tune snares that high anymore when I make records, but, um, but it, sa- it really did sound different. And it's, and it's interesting too, because I didn't really, like you said, I really did produce the record myself. There wasn't really like, you know, Jay, Jay was there when they were making the Lions King soundtrack, but like Goldfinger's first record compared to um, the Lion King's soundtrack. So kind of a different, yeah. just a different style of music, you know? And so I was really kind of running point with all this stuff. And I didn't really have anyone guiding me on, on singing. And I was like, when I listen to my voice now, I was forcing this, like, uh, this thing that just, um, wasn't natural. And I've, I found my voice since then. And, and, you know, I, I love the song and I'm really, really glad the song did what it did, but like, there's a lot I would have done different. Oh, well, sure. Especially to where you headed in your life as a producer and everything you've learned since then. I mean, this was, I'm assuming this record was recorded in 95 because it came out in 96. Yes, that's right. So you weren't using Pro Tools. This was cut to tape. This was all cut to digital. um, It was digital 48 48 track. Oh my God. So it was on tape, but it was like the first, I mean, because Hans was, you know, already kind of, his career had already taken off. He wasn't top of his game yet, but, but I mean, his studio was like, I, I, I still to this day, I've never been in, in such a space age studio that, that Hans owned. So we, we were able to record in the studio that like had everything. Like I recorded on the, on a 47, which is like the Beatles microphone. And we had like all the best analog gear, like these great preamps, you know, every great compressor made, but we, we, we recorded on digital tape. So we had this kind of, clarity to the music that was um at the time i felt like it was re- we were really lucky to be there because it wasn't recorded in a, in a computer so you didn't have the transparency that you have these days with um pro tools and ableton and logic and all that but we were still able to get this really great performance but everything was recorded you know in, in you know one or two takes because we didn't have the ability to tune a vocal or edit the drums we had to you know Darren played everything one take because that's how you did things back then to tape right yeah so you know you kind of answered this question a moment ago so now the the, the records uh, uh pretty much done you're you're uh you know listening to the the first real playbacks you're pushing up the faders to everything and hearing your bedroom comes back and hits you this way out of the speakers in in, in your face what is the consensus at that point i mean it sounds like you kind of already knew this song was special like first single type material but that the, the, the first real push of the faders was it exactly what john feldman heard in his head that whole time a hundred percent. But, but, you know, as a producer, you know, at the time I, I was just throwing shit at the wall. Like what, you know, what does this knob do? Like I said, I didn't know <laughs> idea what, a, what a master fader was or what, a, what bus compression was. I, I had no idea about anything. I just was like, fucking let's try, let's just try stuff. And I, I know a lot more now. So back then, I mean, I was there for every moment. Like, you know, these days I'm not necessarily when I make an album, I'm not there for every, I'm not there for the recording of the shaker sometimes. But back <laughs> right. Then, like, I was like there for every moment. So every step of the way I was pushing the fate. I mean, I was like making, you know, we mixed the song, this guy, um, slam was his nickname. Uh, Slam Andrews was the engineer on that record. And he taught me so much, man. When I didn't even know how to work a computer when I started using Pro Tools, probably. And I think I used Pro Tools for the first time on, um, on Mest's second album. And that must have been like 1999 or 2000. So, um, I mean, Slam really helped me tremendously. And so he was there kind of guiding me throughout the whole process. But when the guys came in to hear the first mix, I mean, collectively, I mean, like like any band, you know, Darren wants the drums louder, Charlie wanted the guitars louder, and Simon <laughs> wanted the bass louder. It's like every band, you know, and so you just basically turn up the volume of the whole mix. And how's this, dude? You know, um, so <laughs> yeah, I'll show right? them. 
<laughs> it's like, what, what do you want to do? Everything louder. So I think collectively we all were really happy the first time we heard here in your bedroom. But, um, you know, going from like a retail job working for like $7 an hour to, you know, being in the recording studio and, and you know, having, you know, being, I guess, you know, being able to like eat at Taco Bell three times a day rather than once. It was like, uh, I mean, I, I felt like that was, um, that was a massive step, but, but I, a little did I know how much work, you know, really had to come to kind of put our flag in the sand as far as being a real band, you know, and, and, and the big, the next big step for here in your bedroom really was, um, uh, was radio. Cause you know, Jay Mojo records wasn't really a thing. It was like, he, he had come up, Jay had come up with a name when he was in college. And he said, if I ever have a record company, it's going to be called Mojo. So we just had this. So we signed to Jay, but Jay, um, like I found real big fish, like they were opening for the, for the skeletons, uh, in, in Riverside. And so I, I know this is off topic for a second, but it kind of connects everything, you know? So once Jay signed real big fish to Mojo, like he, gave the company, he sold the company to Universal Records. So we became a subsidiary. And because of that, it, 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 it helped tremendously, but it also created some uh, roadblocks for us. I remember like we were trying to play Gilman Street, you know, at the time we were like, because I grew up in the Bay Area and it was like, fuck, I want to play, but, but they're like, you're on a major label. And I'm like, but we signed to an independent label, you know, <laughs> we got, they, they wouldn't let us play there. It was like this whole fucking thing. And then, um, but because of Universal, we had a great radio department and that, and that, um, I mean, I always wanted to be on K-Rock. I mean, I grew up on K-Rock. It was like, um, the, probably the third or fourth album I ever bought was this Rodney on the Rock compilation when I was like probably 13 years old. And it was like, changed my life forever hearing all these bands for the first time, Social Distortion and TSOL and all those Southern California punk bands. And so... I always wanted to be on K-Rock. When, when they added us to K-Rock, when Kevin Weatherly added us to K-Rock, he added us 45 times a week, which is like the heaviest rotation you can be in. So I'm in my $100 Dodge Colt, which I bought from my grandma's best friend. <laughs> like I've got every, you know, all my bad religion and Pennywise and no effects bumper stickers all over the back of it. And, and then here in your bedroom comes on K-Rock. And I remember the, the first time I heard it, I just pulled over on – um you know, on Venice Boulevard. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, I mean, all the stuff that happened since then and being able to still like, you know, you and I toured last year and, and, you know, to still kind of have people come see us, whatever it is, you know, what what are we at? Like 25 years later or something? Like, of course, all this is amazing. But that moment when I heard here in your bedroom, on the rate on K Rock specifically in Los Angeles, and that was like I mean K Rock's heyday. I mean everybody listened to the radio. I mean terrestrial radio it, it defined everything as oh, far yeah. as like alternative music goes. Like how to break out. I mean that was like I, I, that that was the moment for me. If I can put my finger on one thing that I'm the most grateful for, it was that moment pulling over, hearing here in your bedroom, you know, with all the radio compression, you know, when you hear your song on the radio and you've got all that extra limiters that they put sure, on. Sure. It's so loud in my little shitty fucking car speaker. <laughs> it was I gotta- so good. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping Helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at soundtalentmedia.com and I'll see you there. I gotta say, John, this is so good because you're answering questions that I have. <laughs> it's perfect, man. It's so cool. Like you're you're I, I was gonna ask, like, when was the first time you heard on the radio? What'd you think? And you're just you're just doing it for me, man. That's awesome. And the feeling that you had to have after I mean, you were selling shoes, you were bummed that the love hogs didn't take off. Here you were without a deal. And you hook up with 
kind of an unlikely team. Jay Rifkin, Mojo, they weren't really proven in the industry. And you go do this record and this happens. You're hearing yourself on K-Rock, which like you said, was the biggest damn thing in the world in the 90s. If you got played on K-Rock, there was a darn good chance you were going to get added to other stations across the United States. A hundred percent. I mean, Kevin Weatherly really defined alternative radio back then. I mean, he still is a, a huge player in the, in the game. Of course, it's just back then everyone just looked to K rock for whatever they added. The rest of the radio stations across the country would just immediately add it with, you know, sometimes without even hearing the music, he was such a leader, you yeah, know? So I, were- I knew that things were going to change. I didn't really have any idea. Cause I hadn't, I mean, I'd done little mini tours and I'd been, I'd been maybe like to 10, 10, 12 places, you know, touring in my old bands and whatnot. But I mean, I had no idea what was laying ahead because, you know, because of that moment and like making the video for that song, you know, Richard and Stephanie from drive through records were really early believers in the band. And, and they put, put us on their public access, a video show back yes, in night show. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Back in 1994. Right. And, um, and they were, they were really early um, champions of the band. And uh, well, that, that's how we, that's how we heard of you was, was through them. And so t- let me take you back now. So you did, you did the Richter demo now and you went to, to do the, to do the record for real. Were you guys playing shows up to that point? We As played, um, we probably played, uh, I mean, before Mojo, I, I want to say we probably played um, 30, I don't know, 30 or 40 shows. I mean, not not a ton. I mean, we played, um, we did a little mini tour with Buck 09. We, we did, uh, you know, Phoenix and, and LA, Orange County, San Diego, San Francisco. We did like maybe um, seven or eight shows with uh, the Skeletones. We did like three or four shows with Blink. Um, uh, but it wasn't like... Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a ton. I mean, we didn't like, you know, do a full national tour. I mean, we, we were pretty much local, uh, just playing local shows. I mean, as much as we could, and then I I was still selling shoes. I had a full-time job. So it wasn't like I couldn't just get in the van for, um, months. We would play, you know, LA on the weekends, just doing little headlining gigs. But, you know, Mojo came along and, uh, and uh we made we made the album and it was like we had it that's when we started going so we were kind of learning learning each other's personalities i mean god damn it it's like had i known how how close I mean, we we played 385 shows in 1996 so um i think there's some like guinness world records for most shows played in one year that we got because <laughs> there were so many opportunities and, and in my mind i'm like I don't ever want to, I don't ever want to lose this. I don't ever want to go back to selling shoes. I, I'm not going to let anyone take this away from me, anyone. Yeah. And so I said yes to every opportunity, everything. So we would play these matinee shows during the day for the radio stations. And then we play like a club show at night headlining. And, uh, man, it, had I known, um, ha- did, that I would be in a van with these like four completely different personalities. It was just like, But, you know, we, um, we made it through, I mean, for the most part, I mean, there was, there were so many fucking fist fights back then, Chris, it was crazy in in our band. (laughs) Well, you had Darren in the band, so that explains a lot. (laughs) And look, I love, I I, I love Darren. He's just, um, you know, he's got a really strong personality and, and, um, and, and so do I, and so does Charlie. I mean, all three of us are so fucking, we're all very, you know. The, the, yeah, definitely four headstrong. You guys were, you know, the three, you guys had completely headstrong individuals. Uh, I could see butting heads. The reason I had asked the question about playing the shows was, you know, I wanted to ask because you, if you know, if you were playing shows pre the record, besides the, the, the demo you had out, there wasn't, you know, anything for people really to go on. So you were doing these shows with Skeletones and Blink and, and Buck 09. Do you remember prior to the record coming out any reaction? to hear in your bedroom versus the other songs. Did you notice that like it got a reaction from people that maybe hadn't heard the song, like, you know, or heard it for the first time? God, that's such a great question, man. I, um, I do remember, I I remember, I remember we would play, uh, we would play, and we had a song called fuck LA, which was like basically about traffic. It was like this, this kind of hardcore (laughs) song. And, uh, and, and 
that was kind of the crowd favorite. We had another song called Mabel, which is kind of a goofy halftime, halftime song. And which then we made had, the first record. Made the first record. And and then we had a couple ska songs, uh, the song called Pictures, a song called Answers that were um, just kind of more straight ahead ska punk style. And uh, those yeah. ones went over great. But here in your bedroom, never, it just never connected the way that it did after it became a song on MTV, on the radio. And um, at the time, MTV was still like a viable tool to use to market your band. And it was like, oh, I mean, yeah. we made such a, I mean, Richard and Stephanie made such a great video for that song. It's like, it's super fun, really colorful. And um, they just, they got the right kind of, I mean, everyone, all the fans in the video were great. And it's just like, it connected. And, and I think the energy of that song was kind of unparalleled at the time because we were still kind of coming out of the grunge phase. I mean, Green Day had Green Day had hit the, the year prior, and so there was this. There was definitely like an energy, but it was like um, I don't know the video we made with all those kids in it. It was just so cool, and here in your bedroom just became this a song that people knew the lyrics to where if they heard it for the first time live opening for buck 09 in front of an audience that had never heard a goldfinger and never heard our music it didn't connect the same way it did once people knew it huh interesting so um one last thing about here in your bedroom that i never knew and god john i've seen you guys play that song hundreds of times i've heard the song so many i always thought that you had a key change which you kind of do, but I thought you just completely went to another key for the first time. And this morning, before we, we got together to do this, I picked up the guitar and I'm like, I'm going to figure out the arrangement here. And I noticed that it's E, B, D, A. And then the chorus goes, same progression, but C, G, B, F. And then when it goes back to the verse, it just goes back to E again. But it sounds like there's a key change, which is so friggin' cool, man. Like, I don't know if <laughs> if you think it's as cool as I think, but it was it was really neat. It sounds like they're like, holy crap, they completely changed keys, which which you did. But but you were already there at the beginning of the song. But I, I never put two and two together that that it, it went back to the same uh, same chords at the beginning. I thought it went somewhere completely different, which that's that's just a cool part of songwriting. Yeah, there is. I, I, I appreciate you noticing all that. I remember Rivers, you know, I, I grew up in L.A. with, um, you know, Rivers from from uh, Weezer and he actually noticed the same thing. I remember when he pointed that out, I was, you know, just, you, you know, trying to figure out I didn't really have that much knowledge as far as how to, write, you know, how to write music and what what formulas work and what what don't. But um, which ironically, the the Electric Love Hogs bass player is the bass player in Weezer which um, was kind of come full circle. And uh, he, um, so, you know, Rivers pointed that out. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I love the key change. And there is a key change. And, and the interesting thing is like, typically when you write a song, you want the chorus to lift. You want the chorus to be the, like the simplest, most singable part of the song. And usually you want, you know, the melody to kind of go up. You want the melody to hit you uh -huh. as a higher note than the verse. If the verse is typically a lower note than the chorus. And here in your bedroom, when Does you get the to opposite. The, yeah. When you get to the second verse, I'm like a fifth above my range is a fifth above the chorus in the verse, which is like, it just doesn't make any sense when it come back to the eye. And it was like, you know, I grew up on all kinds of music, like all of us do, like anyone that's a musician, like loves everything. And I, I and I fucking love metal. I've always loved metal. Like, um, and, and, and when I, that last, um, ah, uh, hi, like I do this James Hetfield thing <laughs> in my yeah. voice where it's just like, I just, you know, I, 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 I can't help myself. It's just like, I love Metallica so goddamn much. And, um, you know, but that key change to me was, was some, kind of magical stumbling block that that it just felt good i wrote that song on an acoustic guitar that that jay actually gave me which i still have this um harmony acoustic guitar a 1975 guitar and i just wrote the, the chords just kind of like made sense it wasn't like um you know like a lot of songs i write now the chord structures don't really change but the melodies and lyrics do and and for me it's all about the like the concept and the lyric these days where back then it was just like whatever whatever worked it was like a, a wild west of songwriting for me because i just didn't understand it and right. I, just, I just stumbled upon it which is great 
Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenged Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks with Johnny, streaming everywhere now. And there's a beauty to that. And that's what after 20, God, I heard that song uh, 24 years ago now <laughs> here in your bedroom. And all these years, I really, I never realized that you started the song in E and that you went back to E for the second verse. It sounded like you went to another key to me all these years until I picked up the guitar and I had that aha moment. I'm like, that's fucking cool, man. And <laughs> that's kind of like later today, I want to write a song and and, and um, I'm going to steal from your playbook there, John. It's really awesome. Yeah, um, do it. <laughs> so um, at this point, besides Goldfinger, uh, uh, you know, no disrespect, but you don't really have a track record as a producer. So how'd you land that gig? I figured if I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going to be, become a legit engineer. I want to learn how to do all of it. And so um, at that point, I'd, I had already made, you know, I, I had dabbled with that TSS band. I'd made Goldfinger's first two albums. And then um, and then I'd been in the studio with Tommy Lee, you know, kind of, you know, messing around with the Love Hog. So I had a bit of knowledge. But I really like, I mean, I, I rented every piece of gear I'd ever wanted to, to rent. And um, uh, I just basically made this demo of three songs that uh, sounded pretty cool for a guy that didn't really know what he was doing. And then I had my manager, John Reese, who we all know and love, you know, sure. he, he managed Goldfinger and managed me. At, I mean, he managed Goldfinger. I wasn't a producer at the time, but I told him, I said, dude, I want to be, I want to start doing other stuff. And so he was friends with Guy O'Siri sent him the demo tape and, and, you know, John's the greatest salesman of all time. And he basically sold me to Guy Osiri who signed show off to Maverick records, which was Madonna's label. And so we had a budget and then we made that, we made that album. So, but it was me like taking, you know, taking the initiative, to fly them out, do the work and prove, I had to prove it. And I, you know, I took a bunch of photos. I think I, I asked a favor of Lisa Johnson, um, who we love, you know, and she took some photos of the band and, um, you know, I made a little, I think I had a little, you know, super eight video camera and made like a little makeshift video. And so I presented the video, the photos and the story and the three song demo to Maverick. And that's how they got signed. That's awesome, man. So from show off, of course, you did Mest. You did the used early on, uh, which were, were breakout records for all those bands. Of course, Good Charlotte, Story of the Year. Um, looking at the list here, Panic at the Disco, All Time Low, Blink-182. You've been doing their recent projects. Um, you know, you, you've you just, uh, I, I, at the top of the, the show, I said world-renowned producer. That's what you've become. Um, what... If you were, and I, I know one of your, you already gave me your proudest moment was pulling off the side of the road there when you heard, when you heard here in your bedroom on K-Rock, but um, production of, of a record that you worked on outside of Goldfinger, uh, what's your proudest moment there? You know, the taste of ink with the used probably because it, you know, it. Oh, it, I love that song. God, uh, so good. If I had left, it's It is really a great song, and I didn't have anything to do with the writing of that song. All I all I did, I mean, I produced I produced the use, you know, which which basically means that I I um, kind of helped shape their sound. I got all their tones. I, I figured out how to you know sample drums because we had to record that song in this little teeny room in Marina del Rey where I lived at the time, and it was like I, I made the most out of it. I learned how to I learned how to run Pro Tools during that album. Like I, uh, I really cut my teeth and that was going from, I think, you know, uh, an average, a pretty average producer, you know, producing, me I mean, Mest was great, but it, Mest wasn't like a, a big stretch between Goldfinger and Mest. I mean, they, they were very stylistically the same, uh, you know, pop punk band. And, and then, you know, the U's were so different and I knew that we had to experiment sonically with a bunch of different sounds and Bert, you know, there was no one I'd ever met like Bert and I'd never seen a performer like that guy. And, uh, and so the taste of ink was, was a song that they had written the verse to. They had this like really great verse, but then it just went from a verse 
to some chords and then to another verse. And so I pushed and pushed and pushed until they wrote that chorus of here, here I, I am. am. Yeah, yeah, alive yeah. at last. That whole section, like I, they wrote in my living room in Marina Del Rey, and I just I pushed and pushed to kind of like help make the song a better song. And I think without me, and and that's you know I I know my value is um I, I know without without me and without them it wouldn't have happened. Both of us needed each other, but right. I really like feel like that was the moment that I became the producer that I am today, where I, I took the initiative and I said, you know, I asserted myself in the situation, knowing I'm not in the band, knowing I'm just an outsider looking in, trying to help this band become the biggest band in the world, which is what they said they wanted to be. And I helped push them to make that song one of the greatest sh- songs of that genre. Oh, that song's just, it defines the 2000s. It's, and it's one of my favorite, probably all time songs. If I was to have a top list of 50, it's in there. I love that song. I love that band. Um, John, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I, lastly, I, I'd like you to uh, take this moment to plug anything uh, just for yourself, for Goldfinger, uh, uh, stuff you're producing, working on. Uh, tell the world what's going on with uh, with you. Well, I mean, like everybody these days, I've been I've been stuck in the studio. I'm not playing a lot of shows out out live right now, and uh, um, I've been just working on. I've been doing all sorts of stuff. I've been doing tracks for this guy, Little Pump. I'm working with this girl, Rico Nasty, this rapper. She's amazing, and I have a record label called Big Noise, which I, I started with John Cohen. John Cohen started Vagrant Records. He uh, okay. signed in 1975, and Edward Sharp. He's just a legend. So him and I have this label with this guy Nick Gross together. Nick Gross is the drink. I think you know Nick. He's playing drums in Goldfinger these days, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so we signed this kid, Arrested Youth. He's like a um, ra- ra- alternative rapper, really, really good, good dude. And so I've been working on that. I'm making a new Goldfinger album, and I'm just staying in the studio busy. Awesome, man. Well, uh, yeah, can't uh, can't wait to cross paths uh, in the live sector again with you, uh, or at this point with anybody. I think everyone's dying to get back out there. <laughs> I know, man. I know. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. You are a busy man. Thank you for taking the time uh, uh, to talk to me. And uh, I I wish you nothing but the best. Yeah, you too, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, gang. A very special thanks to this week's guest, Mr. John Feldman, and to all of you listening who have already subscribed to Krista Makes a Podcast. Your feedback has been tremendous thus far. I really appreciate it. Uh, A couple things before I wrap up here. I'd love to write you your very own custom song. Uh, That's right. I'll write you a song or one for that special someone in your life, a jingle or voiceover for your business or podcast, and anything else you can think of when it comes to a -a one-of-a-kind custom song. In addition, I'm now doing live one-on-one video consultations, uh, song collaborations, co-writes, production, questions regarding the music business, and everything in between. Um, For more info on all of the above, please check out KristaMakes.com or email me at KristaMakes at gmail.com. I can also be found on Facebook at Krista Makes Official, on Twitter at Less Than Chris, and Instagram at Less Than Christy. All right, be good to each other. Until next time. Each week on the One Hit Thunder podcast, we welcome a special guest to come take a deep dive into a one hit wonder artist with us. And together, we decide if that artist brought the one hit thunder or was nothing more than a one hit blunder. You can find One Hit Thunder anywhere that you listen to podcasts. So hit that subscribe button and join in on the fun each week.